praise the Lord. Open your Bibles with me uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, open up our eyes and our ears and our spirits that we hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us. Minister to each heart and each life here we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The night before Jesus uh, was to endure the suffering of the cross, uh, he brought together his disciples and he uh, he established a, a uh, an ordinance, uh, something that we are to do on a regular basis, uh, and it's filled with all kinds of symbolic significance. Uh, we call it the Lord's Supper. And uh, uh, this didn't just happen. Jesus, on purpose, decided to, to, uh, to begin this on the night before he died. Now, but I'd, like to, I'd like to examine the, uh, the Lord's Supper up against the Passover and uh, and, and see that God has a design. God, God always has a plan. I, I, we sometimes we wonder why did this happen or why did that happen. But if we would, if we would understand that God has a plan, and uh, when God uh, established the Passover, uh, it was the same way. He established it the night before uh, uh, they were to bring it to pass. The night before the Lamb was to be slain so that they would be delivered uh, from the death angel. And so we see in both cases, the Passover and the Lord's Supper are, are very symbolic, and yet the Passover is a typology of the Lord's Supper. Now, uh, when, when we say typology, we're not saying uh, that it is exact. In fact, uh, usually a type of Christ uh, mentioned in the Old Testament is always less than, than the, the real thing. For instance, a, a lamb is is not like Jesus, but when, the lamb is a typology of Jesus. I don't know whether you uh, any of you remember the typewriter. Okay, uh, that that was uh, quite a while ago. But uh, a typewriter had had a uh, an arm that would strike a ribbon that was next to the paper, and it would print a letter. And if you looked at the letter, the letter was correct. But if you looked at the the arm that struck the ribbon, it was it was actually backwards, and that that's that's where we get the word typology from because uh, it is it is a uh, an exact uh, it, it points toward uh, the real thing, and so uh, when we talk talk about typology, we're saying uh, everything that, that God uses as a typology in the Old Testament points to something that is real. Um, from from the uh, from these services we uh, uh, or these ordinances that we have in the Old Testament, uh, they point to the real thing that Jesus established in the New Testament. That that points to something even more real uh, in the fact that Jesus Christ is going to be coming back. Uh, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter eight and verse five, it says this. Uh, who serve unto us the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was, at, was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for it, he said, For see, saith he, that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you in the mount. In other words, uh, it's saying here that 
Uh, that all, everything that Moses did was a typology or was a shadow. Uh, it was not the real thing. For instance, there was what Moses called the Holy of Holies. There was the, uh, the, the place where, uh, where the priest would go in once a year and offer a sacrifice unto God. It was called the Holy of Holies. But that was just a typology of the real thing. We know uh, that the real thing, the Holy of Holies, is in heaven. And we know, uh, it, it, it was, it's kind of neat that uh, uh, when, when they had the uh, Ark of the Covenant, they, they put two angels on top of the lid. And uh, uh, the, uh, the Russian Bible doesn't uh, bring it out as clearly as the, as the English Bible does, but in between those two angels, the, the high priest was to put the blood. And in, in the English Bible, we call that the mercy seat. It, that, that's the place where the blood was applied. And, uh, and so uh, every once a year, the uh, priest would come in and he would put blood on, the, uh, on that area right between two angels. And, and, and maybe you've seen the angels, they have their wings covered, uh, tip touching tip as they, as they look at the mercy seat where the blood was to be applied. Now, I've got news for you. That's just a typology. That's, that's, only, that's not the real thing. The real thing is in heaven. In, the real, in, in heaven, God has His two biggest angels standing where Jesus came into the Holy of Holies of heaven and applied the blood that was spilt upon the cross. He took that blood and He put it on the mercy seat. And He has His two biggest angels standing guard over, over that. Uh, you know, that, that's because He wants you to be aware. He wants you to understand that, that the blood of Jesus Christ shall never lose its power. The, the, neat thing about, the, the neat thing about that is that in heaven, nothing ever dies. So when, when Jesus took His blood to heaven, it was not necessary the next year to come and die again because the blood is still fresh. The blood never loses its power. The blood never loses its power. And so, and so when Jesus Christ uh, took His blood and applied it to the mercy seat in heaven, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I tell some, some people that in, in, the real, in the real Holy of Holies, either one of the angels that's guarding the, the, the mercy seat could, could, could defeat the devil with, with one wing tied behind him. You know what I mean? Uh, that, that's... that's God's assurance to us. It's God's assurance to us that that uh, the, the that that the mercy seat is protected forever and ever. And so we uh, we see that in typologies that uh, that uh, uh, there are four qualifications for something to be a typology or a shadow of things to come. The first thing necessary is that it, is, it needs to be divinely ordained of God. To be a foreshadow, uh, it, 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 it's a it's an object that, that says something better is coming. But this will point you to what God wants you to know. The second thing that is important about a something that foreshadows uh, the real thing is that uh, it needs to resemble the type and the image. For instance, um, uh, Moses took a a brass servant and put it on a cross. When there was a plague going on in Egypt, he took a brass ser serpent. Now, I'm here to tell you right now that Jesus Christ is not a brass serpent. But, but what the brass ser rep serpent represented was the, it represented Jesus Christ as he took upon himself your sins and my sins. And, and, and as he took upon our sins, uh, because he took our sins, if we look upon Him, like the, like the children of Israel did in Moses' day, if they looked upon that brass servant, they were healed. And if you need healing today, you, you, don't, you don't have to look at a brass serpent. You can look to Jesus Christ because He is the real thing. He, that was a typology. That was just telling them there's one coming that's going to hang on the cross and He's going to bear all your sicknesses and all your diseases. And if you look to Him, if you look to Him, He will heal you. The, the third thing that uh, is necessary for it to be a shadow or a, or a typology 
is that it, there must be evidence that the type was designed and appointed by God. Uh, so we, we see that the, these typologies are things that God has commanded uh, to, to Moses or to Joshua or to some of the others that, that were in the Bible. They, they, they listened to God, they heard what God said, and they did what God told them to do. And the fourth thing is that the type must prefigure something in the future. The type must prefigure something in the future. Uh, we, for, for instance, when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem, that is a that prefigures something else. Do you know what that prefigures? It, it prefigures when Jesus Christ uh, takes all of us and, and we and we enter the, the heavenly uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. We we, we go in and, and we're going to be rejoicing and we're going to we're going to be throwing our crowns down and we're going to be giving him glory and giving him honor and praise because our king our king is finally. Uh, getting his whole kingdom together and we'll all be there to rejoice and to praise him. That's a, so we see that Jesus entering Jerusalem was a prefigure of what is really going to happen well, that day when Jesus Christ welcomes us home. Now, both, uh, both uh, the Passover and the, uh, the Lord's Supper are divinely ordained institutions. The children, in, 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 if you're looking at Exodus chapter 12, in verse 14, Exodus chapter 12, in verse 14, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast for the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it at feast by an ordinance forever. So, so we see that the, that the Passover was to, for, for the Israelites to be a feast that they are, they are to keep. They, uh, just like we read in our text to begin with, that the Lord's Supper is something that we also must keep. The children of Israel understood that God had established this ordinance and that they had no authority to change it, uh, but they were to continue to, to celebrate the Passover. And they, they do that even to this day. The, the Lord's Supper was divinely ordained by Christ. And we, we uh, as Christians, must uh, continue to follow uh, the command of Jesus Christ that He gave in Luke chapter 22 in verse 19 and mentioned in several places but in Luke 22, 19 he, sa he says, this do in remembrance of Me. So we know that when we do the Lord's Supper we're not just doing it because it's something to occupy time but we're doing it because Jesus commanded us to do it. He said, do this, do this in remembrance of Me. So every time we take communion we are to remember why uh, we are taking it. And, and that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, it, I'm talking about it right now is so that we will have a better understanding that as we take communion, as we take the, the cup and, and the, the bread, as we drink the, 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 the fruit of the vine, we, we, we will, we're doing it not just because it's, it's, it's something that's religious, but it's something that we have been commanded to do. Jesus put His stamp of authority on the on the, uh, the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians we find that Paul warned people uh, to, to be careful how they were taking the Lord's Supper. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23, that's what we read. It said, I have received of the Lord that which I deliver unto you. And, and I, uh, I would encourage you that as you partake of communion today, that you receive it from the Lord. That uh, it is true that, uh, that Pastor John is going to stand at the back and, 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 and minister to some of you, and I'm going to be up here at the front, and we're going to invite you to come either here or in the middle aisle there and, and to, to receive your emblems and take them back to your seat, and, and then we will uh, partake of them together. But as you partake of the cup and as you partake of the emblems, I, I, I want you not just to receive it from Pastor John or, or from Pastor Jerry, but I, I want you to receive it from the Lord. And, and as you take it, say, thank you, Lord. And the blood represents, the, 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 the cup represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ for my sins. And, and as you partake it, I want you, to, I want you to remember the phrase in that song, that, that a flood of mercy. God wants to be administering flood of mercy into your life. Uh, Mercy is, it means 
I, it's for those of you who haven't, haven't heard me say it at least a hundred times, uh, mercy is, is you don't get what you deserve. Okay, God, uh, we all, if, if you sin, you deserve death. And if there's anybody here that hasn't sinned, uh, then, then God, then you just committed the sin because it, 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 all is, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you say you haven't sinned, then you're a liar. And the truth's not in you. But, so, but the neat thing is that when we confess our sins, He is merciful. I, I don't care how many sins you've committed. I don't care how many times you have failed God. I don't care how many times that that, that that you have that you have lost it, if you please. There's a flood of mercy available to you if you come to Him and repent of your sins. He will forgive you. And the next the next sentence of that song talks about the amazing grace of God. <laughs> mercy, you don't get what you deserve. Grace means you get what you don't deserve. Do you understand the difference there? Mercy. You don't get death. You don't get what you deserve. Grace. You get what you don't deserve. What, what do you not deserve? We do not deserve to spend one second in heaven. We do not deserve to spend one second in the presence of Almighty God. We do not deserve the healing that He paid for on the cross. We do not deserve the, the, the blessings that He gives to us on, on a daily basis. We do not deserve them. But because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we receive mercy and grace. So I encourage you today that when you receive the, the, the communion, that you receive it. That you receive it not just from a man, but you receive it from God. There's uh, several points in the, the Passover and the Lord's Supper that that are, are, are very similar. First of all, uh, they both were established by God. And second of all, they were established the, ni the night before the, the event was to take place. That, that's kind of unique that God established the Passover the, the night before uh, the, the Passover was to take place. And then He established the Lord's Supper the night before He was to die on the cross. And the third... Uh, uh, similarity is that uh, the their characteristics are unchangeable. They, 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 they remain the same. They, they, they have not changed. And the fourth char characteristic that is, is the same is that they both were established for specific purposes. It, it, God, God had a plan. God, God's purpose is so that we would begin to see all that God has done in His plan of salvation for us. That's why that's one of the reasons why we, we can talk about the Passover once in a while is because, because God wants us to see that, it, that, that it's not just something in the past, but in the Passover, He, is, he has shown us things that, that apply to our salvation, that apply to us, and that we are to, to, to increase in our understanding of what Jesus Christ did as we study the Passover. And last but not least, uh, both the Passover and the, the Lord's Supper contain three elements. The Passover and the Lord's Supper, Supper contain three elements. Uh, the first, the first uh, element that the Passover contains is the Passover lamb. In Exodus chapter 12, we have, there are details of the Passover. I encourage you to read that and, and begin to see Jesus as you read Exodus chapter 12. The Lamb is the central, uh, most important element of the Passover and the one uh, that, it, that has the greater importance. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And so we see in verses 3 to 8 in chapter 12 that, that the lamb was required uh, by God as part of the Passover uh, service, part of the, the ordinance of Passover. And uh, they, they were reminded, the verse 27 reminds them that Israel, the protection of Israel is based upon 
taking the Passover or receiving the work of, uh, of this uh, Passover lamb and, and, and that, that uh, when the death angel is to come and pass over uh, the, the houses in Egypt, if they have applied the blood of, of the Passover lamb to the doorpost, that they will be exempt from the death angel. The second element in, in the Passover is the unleavened bread. And uh, uh, verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 3 says that the unleavened bread talked about the, the bread of affliction, uh, and that they came forth in haste. But there's also another element about the, the, the bread that is important and the fact that it is unleavened. Uh, they, they say it's unleavened. They didn't put leaven in it because they were in a hurry. But God didn't want leaven in it because in, in the New Testament especially, leaven represents sin. And God, and God wanted the, the, the heavenly bread that you and I take. Uh, what, what is the heavenly bread? It is Jesus, okay? We receive him. He is our heavenly bread and, and there is no sin in Jesus Christ so when we when we partake of bread we, we're saying we have we have a, a savior that is without sin there oh that he is perfect and and uh, so so we see that the, the element of bread was also in in the uh, uh, in the Passover also there was uh, the uh, the third element was bitter herbs and this, uh, this was to remind the Israelites of their bitter bondage in Egypt. Uh, I, the bitter herbs, are, they, they, every time they took bitter herbs, they were to say, thank God that the Lord has delivered us from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. They, they were, every time they, they, they took the, uh, and, and the, the the Septuagint has the ideal that, that the, the herbs and the bread were put together so that as they partook of the, the herbs and the bread, that they would, they would recognize that, that, that they were, should be thankful to God that they, have, they were delivered from the bondage of, of Egypt. Uh, in the Lord's Supper, as we read to you, uh, there are also three elements. Uh, the, there is the body that was offered for sacrifice, or if you please, the, the, the body of Jesus that was our sacrifice. Uh, and there is the, uh, the shedding of blood uh, that is represented by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and then there's the covenant itself. And uh, we, we see in the that in the Lord's Supper or in the in the, Jesus was saying, as you partake of the bread, this bread represents my body. Now there are some of the things in uh, uh, there's a word called transubstantiation. They they think that as the pastor prays over the bread and as the pastor prays over the the the, the fruit of the vine and the cup that. Uh, that the, it becomes real, the real body and the real blood of Jesus Christ. We don't believe that. We believe it is a typology, it is a symbol, it is a sacrament that, that says as we partake of the bread, as you receive the bread, uh, it represents what Jesus Christ did once and for all on the cross of Calvary. Once and for all, his, he took your sins. Once and for all, he took your sicknesses and when his body was beaten when his body was beaten once and for all uh, Isaiah would be able to say uh, looking forward to Jesus by his stripes you are healed and Peter looking back would be able to say by his stripes you were healed uh, his body was broken once and, and so when we partake of the bread we're saying we're receiving to the Lord the fact that once and for all Jesus Christ defeated sin, death, and sickness. And, and, and we need to receive what God has done for us as we receive the, the, the bread this morning. I would encourage you to, to, to recognize that as you take, as you take the, the, the bread, the symbol that represents the body of Christ, and as you, as you, as you allow it to be absorbed in your body, uh, by faith receive 
perceive the, what it symbolizes. It symbolizes the fact that by his stripes you are healed. Uh, the, there's also the uh, the shedding uh, uh, the, the shedding of, of Christ's blood, and it and it represents what was in the cup. The, 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 the cup represents the covenant that, God, that Jesus made. And what's in the cup represents the, the, the commitment or the forgiveness of sins that we receive. And, and it, it took the death of Christ to establish this new co covenant. Uh, the, the, the cup, uh, he says in Luke twenty two twenty, 20, the cup is the New Testament in my blood or the new covenant in my blood. So as we, and, and the, 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 the cup and the blood are, are inseparable, okay? They're inseparable. You, you can't have the blood without the cup. Uh, they're, 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 they're two elements, but they, they are together so that you would understand that when you receive the cup, and as you partake of the, the symbol that represents the blood of Jesus Christ, you're, you're, you're saying, I covenant with God. I covenant with God that from this day forward, I will live for Jesus. I will live for him. The third element is the fruit of the vine. Uh, it, we, in, in our church, we, we do not use alcoholic but, uh, as, as, as a basis for our, uh, for our symbol. We, we use grape juice. Uh, we do that because many, there have been in the past people in our church that were alcoholics. And, and so they... If they take take a little bit of alcohol, they it might tempt them to uh, to return to their uh, to their alcoholism, and we don't want to we don't want to put a, a stumbling block in their way. So we, we do not use uh, a fermented uh, fruit uh, grape juice. We use the regular grape juice, uh, and uh, uh, the fruit of the vine is is represents the blood of Jesus Christ. It, it, it represents what Jesus Christ spilled on the cross of Calvary. In, uh, in Matthew chapter 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And, and so as, we, as, you partake of the, as you partake of the cup and, and, and drink of the, the fruit of the vine, I want you to receive it from Jesus Christ. Because I, I know what happens. I, I, we, we only have communion once a month, and, and by, by, the, by the first Sunday of the next month, you may have failed Jesus Christ more than once. How many of you know that? And, and, and the enemy is going to be beating you over the head and saying, you don't deserve forgiveness. You don't deserve the mercy of God. You, don't, you have failed God so many times, and you failed him again. And, uh, you know, he, he, the Bible talks about the sin and death so easily besets you. And, and, and sometimes there are, there are things in our life that we're battling. We're battling with, with all of our strength and we're having difficulties and sometimes we do fail. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ does not fail. And even if you have failed him, if you have repented of your sin, when you come, uh, you, you renew that covenant, you renew that commitment to Jesus Christ and say, uh, God, I may have failed you a hundred times, but... But I, I, I'm renewing that commitment that I'm going to serve you with all of my heart and with all of my life. So I would encourage you, I don't care how many times you have failed God in this past month, come to him. Uh, even before you receive the emblems, uh, I, I, I was reading in the book of Hebrews and it was talking about the fact that, uh, uh, talking about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews and and, uh, and then suddenly the writer of Hebrews stops and says, you're too ignorant to understand about Melchizedek. That's what he says in, in, verse, in chapter 5. He says, you're too ignorant. And then he explains Jesus Christ. And then in, in chapter 7 he goes on and says, now let me tell you about Melchizedek. You see, the writer of Hebrews understands that, he, that it doesn't take a lot for you to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't. Uh, you, you can you can receive the knowledge that He died for your sins today. You, you don't have to. You don't have to wait. You, you know, 
uh, somehow or another, when I was growing up, because I, uh, I grew up in the church, you know, I, 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 I thought, well, if, when I sin, I have to wait at least three days to ask God to forgive me my sins. Uh, isn't, isn't that a stupid? You know, but, but that's uh, just something that, that we grew up thinking, or I grew up thinking. Uh, I also, when I was younger, you know, uh, how many of you ever been in grade school and, and you erased something and wrote it again and it was wrong, you erased it again and you wrote it again? Somehow or another, I thought the unpardonable sin was when, when God erased my name one more time from the Lamb's Book of Life and it made a big hole in the land where my name was supposed to be. I thought maybe I committed the unpardonable sin. But I'm so glad that God forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives. Did you hear me? God continues to forgive. He says, come unto me and I will in no wise cast you out. Come unto me, all oh, you the labor and the heavy laden. And I will give you rest. And that's what he's saying as he, as he takes the, the, the fruit of the vine and says, this is, this is the new covenant in my blood. As we see both, both institutions, the Passover and the Lord's Supper possess a lamb. In the Passover, it's a literal lamb. In the Lord's Supper, praise the Lord, it's the Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for even Christ, our Passover, our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us once and for all. Clearly from this comparison, we recognize that the Passover is the typology of, of the Lord's Supper. The, the, the thing about the lamb, both in the, in the Passover and in the, in the Lord's Supper, it, it has to do with the maturity of the lamb. Uh, a lamb is not mature until it's one year old. At one year old, it's no longer uh, uh, relying on its mother. It, it, it is considered an adult. It's considered mature. And so that's why the Bible requires that the lamb and the Passover be at le least one year old. Uh, and uh, the lamb has to be a male. So uh, we see when Jesus Christ came, uh, he, of course, was a male. But it also says in, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 23, Jesus began to be about 30 years of age. Now, uh, this 30 years of age is important because in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 3, it says that, uh, that from 30 years old and upward, even to 50 years old, uh, a priest can enter the temple, can enter the, and so he's considered, a priest is considered mature when he is 30 years old. And so that is why, that, that is why uh, when, when we consider the lamb, the first lamb has to be a male, the lamb has to be mature. Our lamb was a male and our lamb was mature. Uh, uh, also, the, the time of sacrifice should, was, should be about 3 o'clock. Uh, uh, they, they were to sacrifice the, the lamb before it got dark so they could prepare it so they could eat the meal. So somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock in the evening, the, 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 in the Passover, they were to prepare the lamb. At the same time, Jesus Christ was crucified about the ninth hour. Think about that. So, so that's, that's like 3 o'clock also. And so the same time when the high priest was, was killing the lamb in the, in, in the temple, uh, Jesus Christ was shedding his blood on the cross for us as our lamb, as our, uh, as our Passover lamb. Uh, and... The Bible says in verse, uh, uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46, that it should be one lamb per house. One lamb per house. And, and I like that symbol, that's, that's so symbolic to me because that, that, that speaks to me of what, uh, what the Bible says later on in the New Testament. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your house. One lamb for a house. God believes in household salvation. 
And I want to encourage you to, to begin to, to believe God for, for your, your unsaved loved ones, for your sons and your daughters, your brothers and your sisters, your mothers and your fathers. I want to encourage you to, to realize that, that God has given us a, a plan that, that as we pray, that, you know, we, we, we have a typology of that. When the spies uh, were, 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 were checking out Jericho and they, and they, and they went to this woman's house. She wasn't a very nice woman. Uh, but she believed in Jehovah God. And she protected the, the men of God. And, and they said, if you, will, if you will put this cord, this red cord that you're letting us down out of the window with, if you'll put that in your window, when you come, Bring, bring your whole family, bring your whole family to the house, and your family will be saved. A typology that God believes in household salvation. I, I know some of us, we think my husband is so far gone. My wife is, is, is so far out there. My, my children are, 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 I just can't handle them anymore, but I'm here to tell you that God can. God can take care of your husband and wife. God can take care of your children. God can take care of your brothers and sisters. If you'll if you cry out to God and say, God, God, I, I believe that the, the, the lamb was slain, not just for me, but for my whole house. Amen. Praise the Lord. The lamb was to be a, a whole lamb. It was not, not one bone was to be broken. And this is significant because when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, the, when, it, when, it was, when it was evening, the, the procedure was they would hang on the cross in the evening, and then they would go just to make sure they don't climb off the cross or somehow or another escape alive, that the Roman soldiers would go and they would break the legs. They would break the legs of all the, uh, those people hanging on the cross because without the legs, they were not able to support themselves. And, and they could not breathe then. They, they would eventually uh, suffocate because their legs were broken because they could not support themselves any longer with their feet. And the neat thing is that when the soldier came to Jesus, he said, he looks dead. He's dead. Just leave him alone. You don't need to break his, don't need to break his legs. And the one Roman soldier says, I don't think so. And so he took his sword or his spear, excuse me, and he stuck Jesus Christ. I, I, I believe he went right under the fifth rib. I, I believe he went right into the heart. And the reason why I believe that because, is because the Bible says that out, as he pulled his spear up, out came blood and water. Blood and water. Now, I, I, I used to work in blood bank in, in, in my early days. And, and, and I, a laboratory technologist said, and I know what happens, or, or, or that it takes about an hour and a half or two hours for the blood to separate, for the cells to settle to the bottom of, of, of the, the test tube, and for there to be uh, plasma, or if you please, water uh, above the cells. And, and, and so what that tells me that when Jesus Christ said, it is finished, it, or he was saying it's complete, the work of the cross is complete, but he gave up the ghost. And so it tells me that from that moment on, he, he, his spirit was gone. He was, he was already uh, before God in heaven. And, and, and so when, when he took the spear and he stuck it into the heart, out flowed the, the plasma that looked like water and the, and the blood cells. And, and it tells me that Jesus Christ gave his, gave his life up for you and me. No man took his life. He gave it up for you by himself. Jesus said, no man takes my life. No man takes my life. And so we see that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, John 19, 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Um, let me get to, to maybe one of the last elements of, of the Passover, and that is the death angel. The last stage of the Passover 
the Israelites were required to put blood on the top of, of the door on, and on both sides of the door so that, that when the, the angel of death came, that they would, the angel would see the blood and would pass over that house and would not bring death into the house. And every, every house that did not have the blood applied, death came. Usually the, uh, it was the firstborn of every house died as, as the death angel passed over in Egypt. And I say that because in the same way God has asked us to come and make covenant relationship with him, to enter into uh, receiving the, the, the emblems that represent the Lord's Supper. And as we do so, we're saying, well, I, I am receiving the work of Jesus Christ in my cross, in, in my heart. Uh, the work that he paid on the cross, I'm receiving it, that, that I might receive life and not death. And I, I'm here to tell you that every one of us, every every person here, in, uh, unless you are still alive when Jesus Christ comes, which, which I believe is very, very, very possible. If, if, but if you're still alive when Jesus comes, then, then you need the blood of life to go with him. But if, 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 you, if you die before Jesus comes, you need the blood applied to your life. You need to ask, ask Jesus to come in, into your heart and, and cleanse you of your sins and make you a, a new creation, to give you a, uh, give you a new life and... and he can do that. He can do that today. And I want to encourage you that, that there, is a, there is an angel of death. There the, the, the Bible says it is appointed in the man once to die. And after that, the judgment. And the, the difference between whether you'll be judged and, 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 are, and are able to enter into heaven or whether you are judged and, and are not able but are, are cast into the bottomless pit is determined by whether you receive the work of Jesus Christ that is represented by the Lord's Supper. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. He made a covenant that if you will receive him, he will in no wise cast you. He will, he will accept you as, as his dear son, as his child, if you will receive him. And, and, and so the provision is there. You can, you can receive Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you that everyone in, the, in Egypt that did not apply the blood to their doorpost, death came into their home. And I, my desire is that, that when, when it comes time for you to face death, there, there's, something about, there's something about a Christian. You see, you, you, your body will die, but your spirit won't. And that's so important. When it comes time to face death, and you've accepted the work of Jesus Christ, God will come and will take you home to be with him. And that's my, de that's my desire for you, that you would receive Jesus Christ as Lord and say, you, I, 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 want, I want to encourage you right now to, to bow your heads. If you're a Christian, I want you to bow your heads and I want you to pray. But if, you're, if you've never made Jesus Lord, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for your sin, if you've never understood that Jesus Christ took your sins and nailed them to the cross, if you're here today and you've never done that, I want to encourage you to receive that right now. Just pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he died for me. Thank you that he took my sins and nailed them to the cross. Today I believe Jesus Christ is Lord, and I make him Lord of my life, and I receive the blood of Jesus Christ applied to my heart to cleanse me from my sin. Today I receive Jesus as Lord, and from this day forward I enter into covenant relationship with him to live for him who died for me. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.